Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Global Foundries today with Gary Patton, the Chief Technology Officer, who's going to talk today about the era of connected intelligence. Gary, we've been talking about intelligence at the edge for some time. What's changing? It's here. It's, it's now. And while many people have been lamenting the end of scaling, I'm actually very excited about the future. We have tremendous opportunities. We are transitioning from an era where we are making a lot of distributed computing devices to an era where we have the ability to do connected intelligence. Why are we able to do that? Because of the high-speed 5G interconnect, which allows real-time connectivity, and the power that we're now able to put in a chip at the edge at very, very low power. What's changing both from the technology side and also from the customer side? Well, it's interesting. It's a pretty dramatic shift. Two or three years ago, when I would get interviews by reporters, there was a lot of concern about the shrinking fabulous company space, that we were shrinking down to a very small set of customers that foundries would be able to support. What would that be the implications be on uh, the economics of this industry? Complete change from two or three years ago. With this move to connected intelligence, we're seeing an explosion in the number of companies that are playing now in the fabulous space in a wide range of applications, automotive, 5G, AI, machine learning, IoT, and these customers require a much broader set of requirements that can be serviced by just one technology, FinFET technology. And so it's no longer just the, we're gonna develop one chip for a solution, right? We're now moving into a, an era of multiple chips, possibly at multiple different uh, process geometries, all put together in a different way. I exactly. We, we definitely have our focus on FinFET technology for customers who are focused on making large chips, chips where performance at any cost is the requirement and companies that have the design resource to design in these very advanced nodes. But that's not everybody. There are many customers that are playing in a space now where power is so important and design cost being as low as possible is a very important criteria. And that's where our FDSOI technology comes in. What does the roadmap look like here? Okay. So if you look at, say, 40, 28 nanometer, we've seen many customers move into 14 nanometer, FinFET technology. And you know, as you know, um, we have had a tremendous success, over 80 uh, successful tape outs, first time right in our multifab. We're now ramped to full capacity and running at world-class yields on this technology delivering the ultimate in performance for a pretty wide range of chips, networking, high performance computing, server applications, you know, chips as large as close to 800 square millimeters, really pushing the envelope on high performance. And we have a roadmap to seven nanometer. We'll be having our first customer tape out on our seven nanometer technology uh, later this year. But as I, as I mentioned, you know, this is for high performance. What, what is the technology requirement for customers who are focused on a better balance between power, performance, and cost? They're looking to minimize the design cost to get into a new technology, and they're still back at 40 and 28. They're not at the bleeding edge. Th these customers, we've provided them a roadmap, and that is our 22 nanometer FD technology. And it's not ju that's just the base platform. On top of that is the integration of RF, and RF device, performance in a FD planar transistor is far superior than that of a FinFET. Better FT, better noise, better GM over I, and much easier to de design it because it's a planar device, you can make devices of any device width. FinFETs, you're kind of restricted. You can do one fin, two fin, three fin, you can't do one and a half fins in an RF analog design. Perfect for RF millimeter wave applications such as automotive, such as 5G. And we're also having a roadmap, the integration of MRAM, into this technology, plus ultra low leakage, plus ultra low power variants of this technology to really provide those customers a pretty broad set of requirements. And we brought a roadmap in place for this, which is next generation is 12 FD. So customers who come into our 22, we're at the right time, we will migrate to 12. How many companies are actually going to be moving down to five nanometers, three nanometers, the price is going up fairly astronomically right now, right? Yes, it, it's a much smaller set of companies. Today, there are only four companies developing a seven nanometer technology. 
and I expect four companies will be doing five and, and three nanometer as, as next nodes. And in that grouping, there's only two that are pure play foundries, and that's us and TSMC. The others are IEDMs who are participating in the foundry space. Do you expect that those will become platforms of digital logic on a package, for example? Oh, we're seeing a tremendous attraction now in 2.5 and, and 3D. In our ASICs offerings, you know, almost 40% of our offerings are including 2.5D as part of the solution. And we're doing some really interesting stuff around 3D for 7 nanometer, where we're building, uh, we can build logic chips with the SRAM stacked on top of the logic chip for very, where we need a lot of very fast memory close to the processor. Does that buy you some of the density in a different way? Is it, is it an alternative to just shrinking the chip? Absolutely. You can pack in a lot more in a small space. So is the direction still to move down to three nanometers or whatever comes after five? Five is, five is what, a, a half node? I, I think five, it, all indications are five, you know, five will be half node, again, driven by customers who need to get something out in the Christmas season. Uh, our focus will be to get to a full node shrink off of seven nanometer. That's what we did at seven. We skipped 10, which was really half node. And our seven is a, has a very strong value proposition. We're delivering a full node scaling, very strong performance and power improvement over 14 nanometer. We will do the same at the next, I'll call it next node. I'll let the marketing guys decide what number that will be, but we're not gonna do half node. We're gonna go to a, a full node scaling. So basically from seven, you move down not to five, but to whatever the number is after that. Exactly. So FD has been around for a while. It was always one of those technologies that was more expensive. It was supposed to cross over with what, what was going into silicon. Those dynamics have changed. What are customers looking for now? And what, what's the, the criteria for I'm going to uh, FDSOI versus I'm going to stay on CMOS? Yeah. So customers that, that are looking for low voltage, ability to integrate RF millimeter wave on the same chip, uh, we're seeing tremendous traction. We've got 36 design wins and growing. Um, there were three concerns that customers had two years ago, and, and it was captured in a survey that Dan Hutchinson did and, and just did an update on recently. One was, do you have a roadmap? We have a roadmap, 22 to 12. We've addressed that concern. It, it's clear customers now are comfortable with that issue. Second was risk. You know, this is a new technology. Can they, you know, can they, they don't want to be the first one in that technology. We've got 36 design wins. Anybody signing up now, they're not going to be the first. They're going to be coming when this te technology is well into volume manufacturing. And the third was IP. Is there enough IP around that technology? And we've had a very big focus on that since 2016 when we launched our FDX ecosystem. We started with seven partners. We're up to 47 today. And by the end of this year, we'll have 75 ecosystem partners developing IP around this FDX solution. That's been one of the concerns as people move down to the most advanced nodes, right? Because if you if you start spinning out all these different nodes, will IP to be developed for each one of these? And that's happened a lot with the nodelets as well. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. I, I, I frankly, there's some of our competitors who've got technology offerings they're claiming at almost every node number. And, you know, if you had to develop the IP ecosystem around each one of those, you know, you're talking about a many billion dollar investment. We've tried to focus on technology offerings which offer a very significant value proposition and build a very rich IP ecosystem around those offerings. Our 14, our 7, our 22, and then eventually our 12 nanometer. So looking out five years, what does chip design, what does chip production look like? What changes? So, you know, we're really getting away from the traditional Moore's Law. Yes. You know, we'll continue to work on scaling the technology and go to five or three nanometer, whatever, whatever we'll call those next nodes. But it's getting very expensive, both from a technology perspective and design perspective. And as I mentioned earlier, the requirements are changing. You know, there's a, this whole explosion of things at the edge where it's not just about having blazing performance, but about having low cost, having really, really low voltage, low power operation. So we're going to see an evolution where people are pursuing alternative technology offerings like FTSOI, the integration with 2.5 and 3D so you can repartition your chips in a more clever way to get the ma maximum out of the technology. The edge has become suddenly a whole different concept probably in the past few months. In the 
previous versions of the IoT and what people thought of as the edge, it was going to be dumb sensors sitting out on the, the edge of the network, uh, working through gateways up to the cloud. The new version seems to be, it's too expensive to move that data, Some of, and there's just way too much data. It, exactly. By the way, I, you know, my talks that I've given over the last two to three years, I've always pointed out when I've talked about IoT, I'm not talking about dumb devices. I'm talking about intelligent devices. Intelligent devices with a lot of memory. For example, we talked earlier about SRAM stacking on a, on a logic chip, so you can have a lot of memory stored on a chip at the edge, do a lot of the processing there, and, and that's going to be very powerful because as fast as 5G is, there's just so much data. And if you're, imagine you're an autonomous car. You, you don't want to be in the middle of a roundabout waiting for the, the, the system to commu compu communicate to the cloud and tell you what to do. It's got to be done at the, at, the, at the edge. One of the challenges for edge devices is when you're developing these chips, they really have to be optimized for whatever you're trying to do. That's set off by you need to have very low power, you need to have very high performance, but you also have to have low cost. How do those three elements square? Well, I think that's where FDSOI technology comes in. We have specifically optimized it for this space. Very low mass count, very low power, the ability to get performance when you need it for those battery-powered applications by the use of this technique called body bias. We're investing a lot in the design IP ecosystem to help our customers be able to do designs in this technology. It's a much smaller mass count. You know, don't have all this double, triple, quadruple patterning and complexity that you have in the leading edge nodes. So the design cost is much lower. And for these applications, Ed, you're talking about products that once they're in the marketplace, they're going to be there for a long time. We're going to be in manufacturing on 22, I expect, for, you know, easily a decade. Some of these designs also are going to be based upon protocols or, or technologies that aren't quite fully baked. Is there programmability that comes in here as well? Is that starting to filter in? Yeah, we, we see that. You know, and we're developing technologies to allow our customers to do on-chip programming. Um, the introduction of MRAM, we've got a very novel eFuse technology we'll be introducing into these technologies. Uh, we're starting at 14 and 7, but we'll eventually bring it into FD. Gary Patton, thanks for a great look at what's coming down the pike. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I think this is a very exciting time and a time where it's all about innovation and innovating with our customers to figure out the best solutions.